fact of what Jesus Christ has provided for me. I just got a question for you today, that if you are excited about what Jesus has done in you, with you, and is yet to do through you, are you ready to be passionate for him? Let me hear you. Yes. Come on. Are you ready? Are you ready to be passionate for him? I want to stir this awakening in our heart. And I believe that the Spirit of God is just going to breathe in the midst of, of the next few weeks within us as a church that we're not going to be a people that walk out on God. We're not going to be a people that, that, that walk out in the midst of this world and just leave people dying and going to hell. I believe that God's beginning to do something in the midst of this region, in the midst of the heart of our church, that says, God, if there ever could be a soul-winning machine in this region, let it be the people of Faith Center Fellowship. Let it, be, let it begin with us. May my family break the statistic of less than 2% of the church leading somebody to the Lord. May we begin to do something so radical and see God move in such a way that we begin to, to break every, every pattern that's taking place in America today. We should not settle for less than 20% of Americans attending church. We should not settle in the place of where less than 2% will actually lead somebody to the Lord. Listen, you realize this, that today, that 10,000 churches, or this year, 10,000 churches will close their doors. We see it happen around us. Literally, church, listen, I want you, I want you to know this. In the, in the last two weeks, I've had two churches uh, come to us in this region, and they've come to us, and they said, we, we, we see what's taking place in Cherokee. We see what's taking place in, in Alva. Uh, if we don't get some help, we're gonna, we're, we're, our doors are going to close in our church. Can you help us? And, of course, my response is, our plate's full. But that's my initial response. But that's what I'm saying. Let's begin to talk to you about the mission of your church. Let's begin to talk to you about what it is that you as a church dreams about. Church, we shouldn't be dreaming just about buildings. We shouldn't be dreaming just about areas that we can do more ministry. We should be dreaming about souls being saved. We should be dreaming about the church having a greater impact in people's lives. And when I mean church, I'm not talking about four walls and a building. I'm talking about you, the bride of Christ, being passionate about the love of your life. The love of your life. Please turn with me to Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 2. I want you to, to, to see this. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 2, I'm going to read through verse 7. And even though this is a, a conversation that is taking place in the midst of how things will be pictured in the last days, which you and I live in, this is a conversation with you and I individually. It's not just this church alone that this letter was penned, but it is, a, it is an alarming thing to every one of us in this place. Please listen to this in Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience, excuse me, and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you've hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I, I give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. This address to the church is an incredible list, right? We would love to hear these things. We would love to hear these things that you, you hate sin. You've persevered. I mean, you've, you, you've came through. I mean, you, you've worked. You, you've labored. I mean, there's not a one of us in this place that would not love to hear that acknowledgement and that encouragement from the Lord. Man, you've done well, right? You and I would be in the place of we're saying, we'll pat ourselves on the back. We'll say, man, we did good, right? We did good. How many of you know, we, we did this series not too long ago, good is the enemy of great, right? 
Y'all remember that, right? Good is the enemy of great. And there are so many times that just attending church we think is good enough. I want you to understand that there is a love that is driving you to the place of loving others around you. You just got to be passionate about the same passion that's been given to you. This is where it is. It's where, it's where it begins. And so Jesus, Jesus, all right, or in this letter, the word of the Lord is being released to this church. It says, you've done a lot of good things. You're passionate about the right things. But yet there's something that you've done. You've walked out on me. Now, how many of you know that if you were in a relationship with the Lord, that would cut right to your heart? How many of you know that in a relationship with somebody that you care for deeply and they, you sit sitting there and you're in a conversation with them and they're telling you all of these things that you've done, you did good, I mean, you're here, you're here, but here's something that's wrong. I feel like you've, left, you've walked out on me. I feel like you just checked out. That, that would cut us to the quick, right? I mean, literally, it would, it would just cut us so deep that we would say, man, I, 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 I didn't see it coming. Now, how many of you know this church right here, they're listening to the message, and the message says, man, you've persevered, you hate sin, I meant you patiently work, I meant you do all of these things, you're awesome. I mean, we would be sitting in the, in the congregation, we'd be going, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah we did good, yeah, that's, yeah, thank you, yeah, it's good. Thank you, God, yeah, thank, thank you for that encouragement, yeah, we, we do good. I pray once a week, I'm awesome. Come on now, is anybody here, are you with me? But God says, in the midst of everything that you're doing, you've walked out on me. You've walked out on the intimacy of the relationship that we have. Now, I want you, to, I want you just for a moment to pause on your side of the equation of this conversation. And I want you to slide yourself into the perspective in which God holds when he looks at you. When he looks at you, he said, I've given you everything. When he looks at you, he says, I've given you absolutely everything that I can give you. I've given you my love so much that my love was set forth towards you that I gave my only begotten son to go and pay the penalty for your sin so that you would have redemption, so that you would be forgiven, and so that you would have the gift of eternal life. How I many you know that's incredible? I mean, we see that, we, we know that. But when God looks at you, he looks at you not through your experiences in your life. He looks at you through the perspective of his sacrificial love for you and a passion that drives the Father of all heaven directly towards you to say that I gave my absolute best just for you. That's God's perspective when he looks at you. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that incredible? I mean, that's amazing to me that the one that enthrones heaven literally would look at me through the eyes of love and the lives of such deep passion that says, I've given everything for you. All right, that's God's perspective. Now, let's bring us over to our perspective. God, I need you to do more. God, I, I really just don't, don't think that, that uh, you're working hard enough for, for me. Don't tell me you haven't thought that. Come on now, is anybody here? God, I just don't think you're moving fast enough. <laughs> or, here's the famous one. <laughs> it's just not fair. It's not fair that it seems like you're blessing over there and it's like a dry desert over here, God. If it, God, it just seems like you're raining over there, but it's like it's dry here. I need some. Listen, if we would just shift ourselves to move ourselves from our experience to the place of where we say, God, because of everything that you've done, what you've done in Christ, that's enough for me, and I'm passionate towards you, not because of what you can do for me, but because of what you have done in me. And that's enough for me, God. You loved me when nobody else loved me. You reached down when nobody else was reaching out. You forgave me when nobody else would forgive me. And because you've done that, I wake up every day passionate for you in such a way 
that I've got to tell somebody about what you've done in me this week. I've got to tell somebody what you have done. It's not very good English, but it's preaching English. Hallelujah. But what, what, how do we move to this place of such conviction that we become the people that say, God, I'm not walking out on you. I can do a lot of good things, but I'm not going to leave my first love. I'm not going to be the person who walks out on you. Can I tell you something? Today, in the world that you and I live in, God needs you. See, we get into this place of where we, we think and we believe that we need God. God needs you. And he needs me. He needs the bride. He needs the church, which is you and I, to have such an overflow in it that in a matter of quick timing, the greatest harvest of souls is going to begin to unfold in the earth because the church becomes awakened to its first love. I'm not walking out on God. I want you to understand this, that God is looking for your passion and for your love. This is not a, 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 a statement of condemnation, but it should be a statement of conviction unto our heart that when God looks at me, He's not looking through the experiences of my life. He's looking through the love that He has given me. I should be the same way right back to Him. God, I'm not looking for the experiences that I need you to do in my life. I'm just simply looking for you because you gave everything up for me. And that alone is enough. That alone is enough for me to be passionate and awakened. Come on, if you agree with that, go ahead and give God praise in this place today because we need that so desperately bad. When you renew your awakened love for Christ, it becomes a, a, a source of clarity for you when you wake up every, every day. A clarity of what he has provided to you. And over this Sunday and the Sunday following Father's Day, I'm going to break down for you one of the tremendous uh, passages of Scripture in the Bible. It's literally one of my favorites because it brings forth the identity of who we are. This, this was scripted by the Apostle Paul to the letter at Ephesus. And in this letter of Ephesus, he begins to break down why he's passionate about Jesus. Now, the Apostle Paul was a murderer, and if God could turn a murderer into somebody that's passionate for him, how many of you know there's hope for you and I? Amen? <laughs> there's hope for you and I. And in the midst of this letter, the Apostle Paul spends the first three chapters of Ephesians just breaking down our identity and that which what Christ has done for us. And it's an amazing passage of Scripture that so many times I think Christians just, just they go by it. They don't, they don't remember it. But when I break these down for you, there are 12 spiritual blessings. 12 spiritual blessings that God has released through Christ in you, for you, and through you. And in these spiritual blessings, it's not that just to bring an experience to you, but it is to create an identity in you so that you remember who you have fallen in love with. I didn't fall in love with Christ because I wanted to, to get a, a, a ticket, an out-of-hell ticket, right? We just didn't want to get that ticket stamped so that we're not going to hell. We wanted to make sure that we needed to, to make that step. Friend, it is so much more than that. It is so much more than that. God is madly and passionately in love for you, and he has released everything towards you. It's time that you and I begin to stir an awakening in our heart. There's, there's something at stake here called America. There's something at stake here called our communities and our region around us that people are not responding to God, and we are the reason why. We're the reason why. It's us. It's not the world. It's us. And for too long, the church begins to go to a place where they want to they say, well, the, 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 I'm going to hide from the world. No, we can't hide from the world. We're a light to the world. We're the mouthpiece to the world. Come on, world, let's go. I want, to, I want to get next to you. I don't want sin to rub off on me, but what I want to do is I want righteousness to rub off on them. I'm not going to hide from the world. I'm going to get in it. I'm not going to be of it, but I'm going to be in it. Come on now, is anybody here? 
Come on, listen, less, you have to understand that less than 2%, I want you to understand this, less than 2% of somebody in the church will lead somebody to Christ this year. I want you to understand with 10,000 churches closing its doors every year with the rate of population growth, we are massively behind in reaching the world for Jesus. But you go to other parts of the world, they're, they're out doing us. They're out doing us. And we are the greatest evangelistic nation in the world. Come on, church. Is anybody here? I want to stir your passion not only for Jesus and your passion to be in love with him every day of your life, but I want you to understand that when that passion and when that love begins to be stirred in your heart and stirred in your life, it's an overflow in you that you're not looking for experience. You're looking for the lost. You're not looking for somebody to do something for you. You're looking to do something for somebody else. Come on now. Is anybody here? Let's go. Let's become awakened. Let's be the church. Let's be the people that walk in the spiritual blessing of what Christ released into us. So here we go. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through 12. Look at this. Verse 3. Blessed be the God of the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places In Christ, say this with me, in Christ alone is every spiritual blessing. Say it with me one more time, in Christ alone, that's it, is, is every spiritual blessing. Every spiritual blessing is in Christ alone. It's not in my experience. It's not in my job. It's not in my mate. It's not in my children. It's not in athletics. Come on now, is anybody here? It is in Christ alone is every spiritual blessing. Blessing. How many of you know there's a whole generation coming up behind us that need to understand that? That their identity and their security is not found in the experiences of this world. It is found in Christ alone. Keep preaching, Pastor. You're doing good. Thank you very much. I believe we will. It's good stuff. All right, now watch this. Verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. Having predestined us to adoption as sons, that's not being, uh, it's sons and daughters both, by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will. This thing's not hard. It's not a mystery. Come on now. According to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation, the unfolding, okay, of the fullness of the times that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both uh, which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. And I realize that's a powerful scripture. But in this this, uh, passage of scripture gives us the first three spiritual blessings. Now I want you to understand this, that word blessing That spiritual blessing that we receive literally means empowered to prosper, empowered to grow. You grow in this thing called a relationship with Jesus Christ whenever you receive all that he's provided unto you. You see, you understand, listen, the reason that we walk in this relationship a little bit lukewarm sometimes is simply because we forget. Just like Jesus told them in in, in the scripture that we read earlier that there's something that you've done. You've walked away from your first love. You've walked away from your first love. We have to remember that this thing is a relationship and a relationship that we're excited about, we talk about. Come on now, is anybody here? A relationship that we're involved in, a relationship that we're excited about, is a relationship that we talk about. 
People know what we're passionate about. I can spend 15 minutes with you, and I can tell within those 15 minutes what you are passionate about. Here's the question, church. Are we more passionate about our experiences, or are we more passionate about what Jesus Christ has done in us, with us, and through us? Where are we at? But every spiritual blessing... I want to read that. I want to read that to you again in verse three. That blessed be the Lord God, our Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every. Everybody say every, every. spiritual blessing. Now I want to give you the definition of every in case you haven't heard it yet, but it means every, every spiritual blessing, every spiritual blessing. It is unlimited what the love of God is going to do in you, through you, and with you. It's unlimited. And every spiritual blessing is driven by this relationship that I have with Christ. Now listen, let me say this, is that I don't pursue Christ for what he can do for me. I pursue Christ because of what he's done in me. There's a big difference. There's a big difference. I am passionate about Christ, not what he can do for me in experience, but I am passionate about Christ because of what he has done in me. I am not the same that I used to be. Thank the Lord for that. I, I didn't live like I used to live. Amen? Listen, I want you to understand you're different, and that's good. You're separate from the world, and that is good. Everybody say tipping point for a minute. You know, the tipping point is, is when the weight of something becomes so heavy that there is no way that it can hold its balance. It, it hits the tipping point. It goes on over, right? It goes on over. It literally, if, if, I, if I stand on my tippy toes and I eventually go, then I, I, there's no way back. I'm going. The morality of this nation is beyond the tipping point. The morality and the moral compass of this nation is, has passed its tipping point. Laws are not going to regulate God. And laws will not save man from themselves. In Christ alone, my cornerstone, Come on, is anybody here? In Christ alone is what moves our nation from going beyond the tipping point to coming back to a place of moral clarity. I think it's incredible that we have seven plus eight states that are literally taking such a stand on abortion that it's just shaken the nation. I think it's incredible. I think it's incredible. Come on, has anybody here? We get into this, into this discussion about, about sexual identity and, this, and, 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 and the conversations that begin to surround that. Folks, we got to recognize the tipping point and we have to understand God's design and God's plan. It's simple. But when the church sets back and does nothing, not to shout from the rooftops. That's not what I'm talking about. But it goes to everybody that we know and say, listen, I just want to talk to you about the passion that I have for Jesus. It's the best restaurant I eat at. Come on now, is anybody here? Man, it's the best relationship that I have. It's amazing what he's done for me. And can I tell you something? If he's done it for me, I know he can do it for you. Listen, folks. There, there, there is a man-sized hole in every soul that there is. And in that man-sized hole, there is only one man that can fill that hole, and it's Jesus Christ. In Christ alone, my cornerstone. Come on now, is anybody here? In Christ alone, that's it. That's it. The question is, and I'm going to ask everybody to do this in this place today. I want you to measure your heart this morning. I want you to measure your heart and where you're at today. Where is your heart concerning your passion for Jesus? Is it an, such an overflow passion that this week you're going to say, God, because you've done so much in me, 
And because every spiritual blessing has been released from heaven into my life, God, I can't contain myself because of what you've done in me. I can't contain myself because of what you're doing through me. I can't contain myself because of the love that I feel from you. And I'm not looking for feelings, but God, can I tell you something? I'm so passionately in love with you that I sense your touch. I'm so passionate about you that I sense the warmth of your comfort. I'm so passionate about you that God, if you were just to breathe just this much, I would feel the wind of that within my life. Because you have blessed me with every spiritual blessing in heaven. God, I can't believe that you would do that for me. I can't believe that you would do that. Somebody asked me the other day, he says, man, it just, it just seems like you, you, you just love people. You, you, you've got, you got a smile on your face all the time. And listen, I don't have a smile face on all, all the time. And can I tell you something? There's sometimes that people make me mad. There's times I want to hide from people. Come on now, is anybody here? Listen, somebody tell me, boy, you're just really an extrovert. Can I tell you something? I'm an extrovert in some things, but there are some things I'm a massive introvert in. I like my quiet time. I like my space. All right? But the thing is, is that the reason that this reflection is on me is because I'm not special. I'm just in love with Jesus. Yeah. I'm just in love with Jesus. I, I, feel, I feel the wind behind me. I, I feel the comfort that surrounds me. I, I feel the fire within my belly that just stirred up that I know that God has done so much for me. And if I can just wake up in this day and just be passionate towards Him and be awakened in my heart that God is affectionate toward me and in everything that He's released in me, I want to release right back to Him. And then I want it to spill over on other people. Because I'm not living this life for me. I'm living this life for God. In Christ alone, my cornerstone. Come on now, is anybody here? In Christ alone is the breath that is behind me. In Christ alone is every spiritual blessing from heaven. Come on now, when you wake up tomorrow morning, I hope that that song is ringing in your heart. In Christ alone, every spiritual blessing is being released in my life, in me, around me, and through me, and I'm ready to be passionate towards Him. Every spiritual blessing. God looks at you through the filter of His love. I said that earlier, but we've got to shift something in the church today, and this is the shift I'm going to ask you to make today. Stop looking at God through your experience. Stop looking to God through your experience or the lack of experience. If I was to take a poll in this place today and ask this question, how many of you have felt like God has let you down before? I'm sure over 50% of our hands would probably go up because we've all felt that. We've all felt that. There's been multiple times in my life I felt like God abandoned me and just walked out. I've, I've, I have felt that way. It wasn't true. But my experience was starting to dictate to me what God looked like. How many of you are thankful that God doesn't look at you through your experience and the way that you respond and the way that you react and the way that you act and the way that you... Come on, I'm thankful that he does. Oh, come on, when God looks at you, he's looking at you through the perspective of his love. And that's why his grace is so amazing. His grace is not my license to do whatever it is I want to do, but his grace is his embrace. His grace is his embrace of how he views me and how passionate he is for me. So we have to shift this thing in the church to such a place of conviction that we say, God, I'm okay if you don't show up this week. God, I'm okay if you don't answer my prayer in the manner in which I've been praying. I'm okay with it. Because here's what I realize. I'm not looking to you to fill my experience. I'm looking for you to flood my life. Yes. God, I'm not looking for you 
I'm not looking for you to always be on the move for me. I'm just looking for your love to love me. You see, there's a difference. And I want to make a promise to you today. It's not my promise to give. It's the promise of the word of God. But I want to make a promise to you. When you begin to make this shift from just wanting a certain experience and you move to the place of where you're saying, God, if you can look at me in all of my idiosyncrasies, in all of the things that I lack, in all the things that's going on in my life, if you can look at me through the filter of love, I'm going to increase my passion towards you because I'm not looking for you to do anything other than simply love me. I just want you to love me. I just want you to surround me. I just want you to, to breathe on me. I just want your, your presence to fill the vacancies in my life. God, I'm not looking for an experience. I'm just looking for your love. I'm not looking at you, God, in the midst of worship for you to be something to me. I'm looking at you in the midst of worship just to surround me with your love. There's a man-sized hole in every, in every soul and only the God of heaven and earth can fill that hole. I'm just looking for you to love me today, God. When you start tomorrow morning, I, I want to ask you to just to begin to increase this move from experience to love. And say, God, I'm just looking for you to love me today. That's all I need. That's all I need. I, that's all I need. Because I've been looking for love in this place and I can't find it. I've been looking for acceptance in my work and it doesn't doesn't fill me. I've been looking for somebody to do something for me, but God, I, can I tell you, I'm just done looking for experience. I'm just looking for your love because you love me first. God, I'm not going to be the one that walks out on you. I'm not going to be the one that leaves my first love. Can I tell you something? For I, I, I want to challenge you. I've done this before, that literally for seven weeks, if you make your prayer life about God loving you, it'll change everything in your world. For seven weeks, put away your petitions. For seven weeks, put, put, put away the things of your needs. And in the midst of your prayer time, which I know every one of you spend an hour of prayer every day, and it's incredible. I'm proud of you. I'm not mocking you. I'm just saying the truth, all right? I'm speaking into existence what we need to see. <laughs> right? but, but, but literally, for seven weeks, why seven? Because the number seven is a biblical number. It means completion. It's, it's a significant thing. That for seven weeks, God, I'm just going to seek you in the sense of saying, God, I just want your love today. And within that love is every, everybody say it with me, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Every spiritual blessing begins in Christ alone and this passion that he has set forward toward you. I want you to see this in verse 7. Verse 7, In Him we have redemption through His blood and the forgiveness of sins according to the richness of His grace. Can I tell you something? That's enough to be passionate about the Lord. That's enough to be passionate about Christ. Let, 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 me, let me ask you a question. That how many of you are thankful in this place that when God took you into your, and found you in your lowest of lowest, and you responded to him, and he forgave you in all of your blasphemy, in all of your rebellion, in all of your sin, he forgave you. Wasn't that incredible when he did that? It was amazing, and I think he deserves praise for that. But now let me ask you a question. How quick are you to forgive others in the same manner in which he forgave you? Oh, pastor, you could have gone all day without going there. Can I tell you something? It's crazy that the church will fight against the church. It's crazy that people in the house of the Lord will sit there and begin to direct judgment towards other people when all of this thing is the fact is that God forgave me for so much that I should at least, in the minimum, release that towards others. Well, Pastor, you don't know what they said. You don't know what they did. You don't know this and you don't know that. You're right, and you know what? I really don't care. I don't give a rip, tater chip. I don't care what they did because that does not change your passion to, towards the one who loved you more than anything else in this world. It doesn't change who he is to you. But what it does change 
is your ability to walk passionately towards Christ. That's what it changes. See, when your experience dictates to you how you respond to the world around you, we are messing who we are in Christ. Who are you? You're redeemed and you're forgiven. Who are you? You're redeemed and you're forgiven. Who are you? You are redeemed and you are forgiven. That word redeemed literally means that you were purchased and there was a penalty that was paid that you would never be able to pay for on your own. He did it for you. You are redeemed and you are forgiven. Now that's enough for me to be passionate every day towards Jesus, but I've got to shift this passion from just the experiences that I have to loving the world as Christ has loved me. Well, well, Pastor, you mean, you mean I, I just got to let people walk over me? No, 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 no. No, see, love is not weak. Love is the strongest force at work in the earth. It's not weakness. It is literally a strength. It is a fortitude within us that you can say what you can say. You can do what you can do. You can, na- you can drive the nail through my wrist. You can rip my side open. You can whip me until I am unrecognizable. But I will not hold this against you. Forgive them, O oh God, for they know not what they do. I love them. It's the same passion that we have and that we hold within our own heart that there is a spiritual blessing of my inheritance of the Lord that says I'm redeemed and I'm forgiven and I'm going to release that to the world in the same manner. You may nail, you may drive a nail through me and it may hurt and it may be painful, but I love you. Oh, but pastor, I might be lying if I say that. Listen. Do you think for one moment in the midst of your sin, in the midst of that which Jesus paid the penalty for you and bought you out of what you were in the middle of, that at one moment that he was ever lying whenever he said simply, I love you. Come on now, is anybody here, church? I love you. I'm not going to let you walk over me, but I want you to understand I love you. I love you. And your actions do not dictate to me my passion. Your actions towards me do not change how I feel about what Christ has done in me and what I know that Christ can do in you. Listen, my battle that I'm going through is not for me. The battle that I'm going through is so that I can help a hundred other people that's facing the same thing that I'm facing. The struggle that I'm struggling through right now is not just about me, but it's about that I can lead a thousand other people through the same struggle. Come on, follow me. This is what the Apostle Paul said. Follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. In Christ alone. Come on now. See anybody? Follow me. As I follow Christ, I love you. I love you. So let me give you these three spiritual blessings. Here's spiritual blessing one, that you were adopted and accepted by the Father who enthrones heaven. This is who you are. You're adopted by the Father who enthrones heaven. Oh my gosh. That just that brings, listen, we have several families in our church that have adopted. I cry. I, cry. I can barely contain myself whenever we get the opportunity to dedicate those children that are adopted. I can't, I can't hardly contain myself because of the stories that I know about those children. And all of a sudden, this love just began to overwhelm a family that says, we can't let this one go. Come on now, is anybody here? If there's not more of a beautiful picture of heaven, I don't know what is. But your spiritual blessing, your identity is not your experience, but your identity is the fact that you are adopted, not only adopted, but the Bible says, and accepted. You're adopted and you are accepted. You're not going to find that anywhere else in the earth. Come on now, is anybody here? He not only adopts you, but he accepts you just the way that you are. That's the power 
of being in Christ is that I'm adopted and I am accepted. I'll be rejected by the world. I'll be rejected by friends. I may even be rejected by family, but there will be one that will never reject me no matter where I go because he'll love me all the way to hell if he has to. But I want you to understand something. The love of God is so passionate towards you that he says, come on, I want you. Come on. I am the Father who enthrones heaven, and I want to be your daddy, and I'm a good daddy. I want to, I want to seat you in heavenly places. You're going to see that next week or the week after next. He seats us in heavenly places. If I'm not passionate about Jesus, then I've lost the identity of who I am in Christ. And we have to shift this thing to where we become so passionate about Jesus that there's an overflow in us that we say, you're lost, but I got a place that you can be adopted. You're away, but I got a place that you can be accepted. Come on, follow me as I follow Christ. Here's the second spiritual blessing within this passion, within this passage, and it's that you're redeemed and forgiven. We talked about that. He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. When God forgives, you understand this, he washes it away. So stop taking it out of the dishwasher. He cleanses it, and he washes it away. Stop reaching back and grabbing it. And then here's the third one. We're not going to bring this up for you on the screen because I forgot to give it to him, but here's the third one. This is found in verse 11. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of of his will. This is how your relationship with Jesus works. And I'm getting ready to close. Your relationship with Jesus works according to his counsel, not your counsel. Let that just settle for a minute. Your relationship with Jesus works according to his counsel, his will. His will is his word. And God works only in the parameter of his word and his counsel, not yours. It's just a lot easier to do it his way. It's a lot easier to do it his way. And if you love Jesus, you're ready to do it his way. I'm in love with my wife. I'm passionately in love with my wife. But can I tell you something? There's times that I don't do things the way that she would like them done. Come on, man, are you with me? Well, you should have been saying an amen a lot quicker than that. Man, don't, don't leave a fella hanging out here. But you know what I do? I try my hardest to do it the way that she wants it because I'm in love with her and I want to please her. And I want to, I want to make her as happy as I possibly can. And so there's times I do have to repent. But can I tell you something? I'm passionate enough about my relationship with Amy that if there's a certain way that she wants it done, then I'm going to do my best to do it. I don't always hit the mark, but I'm going to be passionate about doing that because I love her. Our relationship with the Lord is no different because we are the bride of Christ. I'm in an intimate relationship with the Lord because he loved me so much that he purchased me. And he's returning not for church. Listen to me. I'm about to drop a bomb on you right now. He's not coming back for a church. He's coming back for a bride. Yes. And that's why he told the church in Revelation, you're doing a lot of good things. You hate the same things that I hate. But there's something that I have against you. That in the intimacy of this relationship, you've walked out. It's been more about the experience for you than it has been about the love walk with you. God's not coming back just for a church. He's coming back for a bride. And in this intimate relationship, I'm passionate about him because I want to do things according to how he desires them. Now, how many of you know whenever you've been married for a long time, you give up some of the things that you desire? That's not a negative. It's just, it's just life changes. Uh, seasons of, of marriage and seasons of family. I mean, there are certain things that Amy and I sacrifice for the sake of our kids, right? We all do that. 
I mean, there are certain things that when you get married, <laughs> you got to grow up, right? I mean, it just kind of happens, all right? But I do that because I'm passionate about her, and then we're passionate about what takes place in our home. God is passionate about you. And he has a certain way, according to the counsel of his will, that he operates in. And you know what? Whenever we operate according to his counsel and not our counsel, there's a richness in our relationship. There's a richness in our relationship. God's coming back for a bride. Here's the question. Do you carry the passion of a bride awaiting the groom? Do you carry the passion in your heart towards God in the same manner that he's passionate towards you? I just want you to measure your heart today because I want you to know something, that there are 12 spiritual blessings with your identity of who you are in Christ. You're adopted, you're accepted, you're redeemed, you're forgiven. And thirdly, God operates according to his counsel. And when you operate according to his counsel, everything begins to change. It's not perfect. But you're operating within the one that has loved you. Come on, if you're ready to awaken your heart in a passionate way towards Jesus, I want you to say amen and give God the biggest praise that you can give him today. Amen. Stand to your feet if you would, please.